So our next talk is going to be given by Mikhail Lambrex on planet formation theory in the era of Alma and Kepler from pebbles to exoplanets. Over to you, Mikhail. Uh, hi, it's, and I'll be uh, talking about planet formation theory in the era of Alma and Kepler from pebbles to exoplanets with Joanna Daskowska, Bertrand Beach, Mikhail Lambrex, Hias Mulders, Daniel Arsona, Alona Vazan, Baby Liu, Chris Ormel, Catherine Kretke, and Alessandro Morbidelli. And some of us are also here in the audience, so feel free re to reach out uh, to these people at any time. All right, 1978. It's the time of Greece, the Star Wars Christmas special, the invention of the Lego figure. You could watch Superman on a laser disc while eating the very first Ben and Jerry's ice creams. It is also the time of the very first Brothel Stars and Plants book. And the very first chapter in that book is about plant formation and includes a diagram like this that goes from very small scales all the way to the scales of planets and lays out different physical processes that could take place. So the question is how much of this, how much of this figure uh, survives to this day? Unfortunately, Johanna also made such a figure, only it is rotated in our chapter, so that's a bit of progress. All right. Uh, we start from dust growth to pebbles, and that will be part one of the talk, and we'll talk about radial drift. We'll continue to cover the plant decimal formation process, and then move forward and discuss various ways to make larger protoplanets that accrete gas and migrate inwards in protoplanetary. So we'll do it step by step. So starting with the start, uh, these young disks of gas around stars, with small, small particles in it. Almas revolutionized the field. We know now that uh, basically all disks start out with tens to hundreds of Earth masses of millimeter-sized solids. And in disks where we can measure it, they also are typically found to be in a very thin mid-plane layer. So this is shown in this figure here uh, of Ophius 16, 31, 31. If you look at the aspect ratio, so that's the ratio of this H over R, you find it is 0.005. That's literally as flat as a pancake that corresponds to stirring alpha as smaller or comparable to 10 to the minus 4. And we have a pretty, pretty good idea why there are so many small particles in protoplanetary disks, and that is because we believe that collisional growth sort of stalls at millimeter sizes. So the idea is that we start with very small monomer sized grains, they form fractal aggregates that ultimately form pebbles. And that's an efficient process that you can just drive by sticking. That's illustrated here in a lab experiment. When you have millimeter-sized aggregates with relatively low relative velocities, they just stick together. But if you take large particles, say centimeter in size, and you collide them with characteristic relative velocities of about 10 meters a second, then you find that the typical outcome is fragmentation, as seen in this lab experiment. And there's another reason why particles don't easily grow larger, and that is that they rapidly drift inwards. And the basic physics of this is that if you were just a pebble around the sun, you would feel the gravitational force, and you would do a Keplerian orbit that is balanced by the centrifugal force. For a gas parcel, the picture is a little bit different because your gravity is basically reduced by the opposite direction pressure gradient force. So you're, you're doing an orbit, but slightly slower than a Keplerian orbit. Then when you embed a pebble in a gas parcel, it actually feels uh, a headwind that leads to a drag force onto this pebble that robs it of angular momentum, and that means the pebble will also spiral inwards to the central object. And the way this happens is by drag force that's proportional to this relative velocity between the pebble and the gas, and some coupling constant we call the friction time, which turns out to be an orbital time scale for this millimeter-sized particle. So that's why it's an efficient process. So if you combine these two things, uh, as in this movie here, particles first grow by collisions, then become large enough to feel radial drift, and at some point they also hit the fragmentation barrier, and so end up all the way uh, into the star. So this is distance uh, in AU, and this is the grain size. You can also reduce the fragmentation barrier and look at a particle that's uh, fragments already at one, meet, one uh, meters a second, and then the inwards drift is slower because the particle size remains smaller. So that's what you see here. And we also observe a dust depletion in protoplanetary disks. So that is what's shown in this figure, which definitely has the largest time arrow of all chapters in the protostars book. 
Uh, so it has here the cumulative fraction of stars and here the mass in dust and pebbles in Earth masses. So the way to read this figure off is that you can see that only 25% of disks have more than an Earth mass in pebbles left after a million years. So a rapid re a reduction of the dust mass. And then you can do uh, population synthesis of protoplanetary disks. So you make a model that includes pebble growth, drift and fragmentation for whole class of uh, protoplanetary disks around the cluster with a stellar IMF. And here you have the observations again, and this is what the model shows. So uh, just look at the uh, thick solid lines here. You see that over time, from 0 0.5 million years to 5 million years, the cumulative mass distribution decreases with time in this fashion, pretty consistent with what we observe. But if you would make a model that does not include pebble drift, you have to look at the thin lines here. And it is clearly not compatible with what we see in the observations. Uh, this still uh, is a very active field of research with many, many challenges. One is that we still don't really understand the relation between the dust mass and protoplanetary dust and the stellar gas accretion rates. We have a hard time understanding the evolution of gas and dust radii. And uh, an important addendum to this is also that there are wide orbit planets that might retain dust uh, in protoplanetary dust. We also have a poster about that. Uh, that is very interesting. All right. So now we have learned about one uh, basic constraint that comes from these protoplanetary disks. That are, we, have, we have these uh, disks that are born with uh, approximately 100 Earth mass of pebbles that then by pebble drift start drifting inwards. And we'll later see also that we have planet growth and planet migration. So there's a general trend around this, this axis of mass concentration during planet formation. And then we can uh, learn something else from this figure, and that is that if we go along the vertical axis, we also see uh, starting from 100 Earth masses, we form plants that have characteristic masses of around 10 Earth masses, and that is sort of uh, consistent with what we know about the high occurrence rate of super Earths around sun-like stars, and we'll come back to that also later. So we get two basic, very basic constraints, and this one kind of hints that we have to look at plant formation at sort of the 10% uh, efficiency going from 100 Earth masses to 10 Earth masses in plants. All right, so let's uh, continue forward uh, with planetesimal formation. And that's a process that takes place on very, very small scales in protoplanetary disks deep within the mid-plane, uh, as uh, shown in this uh, rendering of a real planetesimal formation simulation in a shearing box. So this is what you see here. And you see basically these uh, clouds of pebbles that merge and can form planetesimals. Uh, and that's a very spontaneous process, so that's uh, shown in this figure here. You start with a uniform distribution of pebbles, and very quickly, nature decides this is not an equilibrium point and breaks up everything in swarms that undergo many, many, many merging events. So this is what you see in this figure here. We also zoom in a little bit, so this is time. And at some point, we will turn on the gravity. That means that we turn on the gravity between the pebbles, and that allows these uh, very dense pebble swarms to then uh, collapse into planetesimals. So this is what you see here, and you have a counter of the number of planetesimals formed in this little patch of the disk that you see from a top down. I see many, many, many planetesimals emerge. And you can also study these uh, uh, planetesimals uh, in detail and determine and find that many of those are actually in prograde, are actually prograde KBO. So they uh, have a pro, sorry, have prograde binaries. And that seems consistent with what we find in the most pristine population in the uh, solar system, the cold Kuiper belt object. So here you have the fraction of prograde versus retrograde. The uh, observed Kuiper belt population has this dashed line. And the model from the streaming stability is this full line. It's a perfect match. And moreover, you can study the masses of all these uh, bodies that you formed in the simulation. That is what is shown in this figure here. It's again uh, focused on the cold Kuiper belt uh, population. This is the detected size distribution. This is the d size distribution in orange. And the model streaming stability size distribution is such a perfect fit, you cannot even see it. So I, this is to illustrate that um, also in the solar system, we have evidence that at least at some point there must have been very dense mid-plane layer of pebbles capable of forming uh, these uh, first planetesimals. Now, where and when these planetesimals form remains a little bit of an open question. Uh, I, basically, it is a, a, it's a hunt to find the, the sites in protoplanetary disks that are prone to streaming stability conditions, or so high dust-to-gas ratios. Um, 
maybe a possibility is in the inner disk where particles fragment and then when you include gas drag back reaction you can have pileups like this so here we have again distance to the star in AU and this is the surface density of planetesimals and the dashed gray line is uh, uh, for comparison uh, minimum mass solar nebula worth of planetesimals so this is uh, in the inner disk people have contemplated uh, mechanisms around the water snow uh, line as is in this paper by Jukli Schonenberg or on, uh, 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 around pressure bumps, or in this figure, even during this dissipation. If you dissipate the disk, you remove a lot of gas uh, from the disk, and that naturally drives the dust to gas ratio up, and that is a, a good starting point for the steam instability. Still, all of these scenarios uh, suffer a little bit that we don't actually really very well know what is the plant formation efficiency. Even if we know perfectly well the conditions for stream instability are met, it is not so clear yet to determine the fraction of pebbles that are effectively converted into plant decimals. And then another open question is how the stream instability operates in regions with also background turbulence. But of course work has already been done uh, about that in the MRI and around the VSI where it typically stimulates uh, uh, the stream instability. Okay, there's also interesting posters on this topic uh, in this meeting. So now we've covered dust growth until the fragmentation limited pebbles. That was the first part. We learned that pebbles can self-concentrate to form planetesimals via streaming instabilities. Uh, That's what you see here. And now we're moving on to the next step. Uh, that is about how planetesimals and protoplans continue to grow by mutual collisions and by sweeping up pebbles. So pebbles are basically important because they are created with a large cross-section because of drag. So that's illustrated in this cartoon here. You have a protoplanet in the center and the uh, black point here, that is a planetesimal. And the typical outcome is actually a gravitational scattering event whenever it enters the gravitational sphere of influence. Only when it would come very close and geometrically collide with the central body, you would create something. But that's very different for a pebble, which is illustrated here in blue. Uh, that one benefits from gas drag and spirals inwards in a process that is actually similar to what we discussed earlier about the radial drift uh, of pebbles around a star. Now, this is, of course, a bit of a simplified picture. In reality, it is more complicated because uh, as these simulations show, it's actually a 3D problem, and you have a complicated interaction also with the envelope around the protoplanet. So this is around the low-mass Mars-like body, and this is around the higher-mass super-Earth-like body. But you can condense, basically, these uh, more complicated simulations uh, and determine from these accretion rates, and then you can make figures like this. So distance to the star, and here you have uh, the grain size in centimeters, just to illustrate that first we have collisional growth until this fragmentation barrier, then we have an epoch of planetesimal formation, and then we enter the, the pebble accretion area uh, around masses around 10 to the minus 4 Earth masses, that's sort of approximately Ceres mass. And then you can uh, read in the colors is the mass doubling time scale. So if you enter in the very light green area, you can sort of start determining this is not a very relevant uh, process anymore in protoplanetary disk, but in this area, uh, it basically becomes po possible to grow uh, plants up to this, what we call pebble isolation mass, a point at which the accretion of pebbles becomes uh, more com uh, uh, becomes uh, stalled. And I, I will discuss that in the next slide, but you can see here that in the inner disk, well out to 2030 AU, it is possible to form planets in this way. Of course, it depends on the presence of large planetesimals that uh, have to just sort of jump this uh, mass. And this dashed line shows the largest streaming stability planetesimals inferred from, uh, from simulation. So you can actually just sort of enter straight in there, but it might also depend on a, co uh, on a process where you have basically co uh, mutual collisions of uh, planetesimals up until you enter this area and then you take off with accreting pebbles. Uh, this process of accreting pebbles does stall at some point, and the physical mechanism is explained here. So as a planet grows, in mass, so these are the different lines in here, you perturb the uh, orbit outside of, uh, uh, outside of the planet with a very shallow gap, which is illustrated here. So here's the planet, you form a very, shallow, very, very shallow gap. And this perturbation basically pushes the gas so that it becomes comparable to the Keplerian velocity. And remember, it was the, the, the difference between 
the gas velocity and the Keplerian velocity that drove the inwards uh, drift of pebbles. So a pebble that ends up here in this pressure bump gets stuck and does not anymore reach uh, the plant. So you halt accretion. Uh, the implications are that you that that uh, halting accretion that is also the halt of depositing accretion heat into uh, the potential of the planet that is a good trigger for starting the process of gas accretion and it also has important implications as it can possibly reduce the flow of pebbles to interior uh, embryos although that depends a little bit for example on the fragmentation efficiency if you f if you f efficiently fragment pebbles into small dust grains that they can cover this shallow cover uh, transit through these shallow gaps and basically re coagulate on the other side. Now, here we compare uh, pebble and plantesimal accretion. So, this is the plot we looked at before. Here we see plantesimal accretion, and the difference is clear for an equivalent mass budget. Plantesimals can kind of barely make it beyond 10 AU. So, you can still efficiently form things by plantesimal accretion in short orbits. There's also a poster about this here in the meeting, but at wider orbits, it is difficult to do it with plant decimals. Then I want to say one uh, note uh, about uh, pebble accretion efficiency. So if you go up into this sort of regime where we form uh, Earth mass and larger planets, the pebble accretion efficiency is around a few percent <coughs> up to approximately 10 percent. So that's the efficiency per body. That's not very high. Most of the pebbles that cross the orbit of a planet just drift inwards. Still, one has to be a bit careful with that because it's not the same as, as the efficiency per system. If one thinks about the solar system with a multiple of giant planets, you easily reach efficiencies of about 50%. So I would argue that typically systems uh, are not pebble-starved, but do actually convert a lot, of, uh, a lot of pebbles into planets. Now, there's many outstanding challenges. One, two that I picked out here is what are the pebble accretion uh, uh, efficiencies, uh, accretion efficiencies with realistic background turbulence? We have already had some work on this, but I think much more is needed. And what is also the fate of these pebbles when they enter the envelope? That is actually sort of a new phase of pebble accretion, and we'll talk about that more uh, in part four. Now, when planets grow large, they also start migrating inwards. So, we already talked about radial drift of pebbles, so this takes place on very small particles, millimeter-sized particles, so that's uh, nominal conditions are this dashed line here. So then you enter in this region here, and you can see that we easily exceed drift rates that exceed 100 AU per million year. But then as your particle grows bigger and you follow this line, note that there's a huge gap here in uh, uh, radius. Then you enter, again, a new phase of inwards concentration, and that's the type 1 planet migration regime that you enter here. Again, you find very fast inward migration rates. When, parts, when, when plants grow larger, they enter the type 2 migration phase, actually decreases a little bit, anyway, uh, again, as we saw in the, in the previous talk. So if you combine these two things, you combine the growth, the mass accretion rates from pebble accretion with migration, you get this characteristic growth curves that look always with this you know, sort of typical bent shape. You start out somewhere in a protoplanetary disk, let's say here, and then let's follow the blue line. You grow larger and larger, larger start migrating inwards and towards the central star. Now this process is uh, very sensitive on, for example, the accretion rate. So Bertram shows here uh, different disks with different metallicities, so different bubble flux rates that differ by a factor two approximately. And you see that even starting with the same initial conditions, slightly different choices of the available pebbles lead to very different type of plants. So here we form Earth-like planets, the next step are super-Earth-like planets, and in the following step, we even form, form warm giants. And you see here in this plot, the solid lines are actually uh, solid accretion, and the dashed lines are gas accretion. So here's planetary mass and distance to the star. All right, so this brings us to gas accretion and maybe one of the most important and enduring paradigms of plant formation, the core accretion scenario. The basic idea is that if you want to form a giant planet, uh, you start out with a, a solid core that slowly accretes a gaseous envelope, and then you start accreting such a dense envelope uh, that it, the mass that is accreted in solids, when that becomes comparable to the gas envelope mass, you enter a phase of runaway gas accretion and we form really big gas giants, but if that condition is not met, you sort of bifurcate to another path 
and you form something that looks much more like ice shines, mini Neptunes, or super Earths. Now, I want to highlight two important areas of progress in the uh, last 10 years. Um, <coughs> and this is shown in the simulation here that shows the radius in Earth radii and the density of the envelope. And that's uh, uh, as, as the body grows. You can see the total mass of the body. It, the, dashed, uh, the black line is the total density of the envelope. But if you look at the uh, inner dashed line here, it highlights the region uh, in, the, in the envelope that is completely dominated by silicate uh, vapor that uh, comes from pebbles that fall inwards and then actually sublimate at this SiO2 uh, sublimation line. And it's an important process because it regulates both the planet composition. You can think about metallicity gradients in the envelope of a planet, but also you could actually lose volatiles as they sublimate uh, 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 inwards. And another important aspect is that it also changes the mean molecular weight of this envelope. Uh, clearly, it's a very dense vapor layer, basically, in this planet. Uh, and the opacity is also by this, uh, is regulated by the sublimated uh, pebbles. And these are two, two important processes that regulate plant evolution that we do mean, basically, the gas accretion rate. So this is an area of attention, but it is made even more complicated with something that we also saw in the previous talk is that many of these, uh, that, that these envelopes are basically open systems. So this is shown in the side view onto a planet that is located at zero, zero. Most accretion occurs through the poles and then leaves again through the mid plane. And in this plot here, you can see this is the total mass of the planet. And uh, in this line here, if you follow this line here, it shows the, accre the mass accretion rate and this line here shows the mass flow through the atmosphere. You can see that they differ by 10 to 1,000 times, uh, uh, especially in this uh, low mass regime. Nevertheless, if you actually look here, the accretion rates here still remain high. It's 10 to the minus 2 Earth masses per year. So we still don't really know what is actually the final mass of uh, gas giant plants. It could be that they just form relatively late, close to this dissipation. Uh, but I think it remains also somewhat of an open question how, how gas giants hold their accretion. All right. Now, uh, the next step, we're going to put everything together, the evolution of a gas disk, the pebble, uh, pebble disk, uh, pebbles that move inwards, uh, the formation of plants through planet, uh, pebble accretion, the other inwards migration. But before doing that, I want to spend just one second on the actual observed uh, population of exoplanets. So that is in this plot here. Um, here uh, you see that uh, just uh, the actual exoplanet census. But of course, that doesn't tell so much because it's heavily biased. We find a lot of hot Jupiters here. But uh, that's just because they're easy to find. So you can also kind of box them in in different classes and uh, plot the absurd fraction of stars with super Earths, hot Jupiters, warm giants, and cold giants. So if you look at super Earths, an important finding is that about half of all sun-like stars host super Earths, while if you go to cold giants, that's a very much smaller fraction, you know, six, eight, seven percent of all uh, uh, sun-like stars hold cold giant planets. So these are sort of the constraints. Uh, then, as I said, we put everything together in one model, and uh, then you can play this movie here. Yep. Uh, and then the, a key input in the simulation is that you have an initial disk mass distribution, so how much pebbles are spread out in these different disks that you're simulating, and also the disk lifetimes. You see some of these points freeze in at some point, and those are the, the disks that have already lost all their gas. And this is then the final population they form after a few million years of evolution. Then you can compare this uh, pebble accretion synthesis model to what is observed. Uh, of course, the figure looks very different because uh, this is just a completely biased population. But if you look again at the occurrence fractions, it is not too bad. Super Earth 50%, 36%, cold giant 6%, cold giant 7%. Now, of course, um, the parameter, there is a, there's a, an enormous amount of parameter choices here for the pebble and gas disk evolution, for the gas accretion rates and the pebble accretion rates, for the migration rates. It goes on and on and on. But of course, the fun thing with the synthesis model is that you can just try it out. For example, you can look here at the pebble accretion synthesis um, 
results for a low value of vertical pebble stirring, so well settled pebble midplane layers, or one where the pebble midplane layer is actually more stirred up. And you can easily see that when we remove pebbles basically out of the midplane and therefore they're less easy to accrete, that we also reduce the fraction of plants that we form in white orbits. Here it's 2%, not longer consistent with what we see. But you can go beyond such exercise and can also explore different theoretical assumptions. For example, these are the results from the Bern uh, population synthesis group. And you can see that if you do it with single bodies in a similar way uh, as done for this pebble accretion synthesis, you find that basically all these fractions, especially for the coal giants, are too low. That's not so surprising. If you run a model that starts out with 300 meter size plant decimals, so basically you convert all, all mass first to 300 meter size plant decimals, uh, that uh, forming or planets in wide orbits, as we see the, the, the mass doubling time scales were very long there, it's difficult to form this, uh, these cold giants in a wide orbit. There are other ways uh, they've explored to get planets in wider orbits, for example, by considering multiple planets in the same simulation, so that's pretty advanced with n-body simulations. Then you see that, uh, uh, that you can get this cold giant fraction right, you know, so at a 6% level, but that goes at a cost of overproducing the population of super Earth, right? so 82%. Now, there are many challenges and opportunities. I think with population synthesis work, the uh, next thing to do, and uh, people already are starting working on this, is uh, trace further the composition so that we can do this, but also recreate mass radius relationships, keep track of the multiplicity. This is really the state of the art, working with uh, uh, simulations that include uh, uh, embody effects that allow you, for example, to track the super-Earth versus cold giant correlations in this figure also. Uh, and there's a, a whole bunch of papers here that I'm citing, and I think we might hear also a little bit more about that in the uh, talk on the chapter by Weiss et al. All right. So now I, we talked about uh, population synthesis, but that's sort of a, a brute force attempt at trying to understand uh, plant formation. It's also important to go back and simulate I would say what I would call archetype systems. And we've done that for a long time in, uh, in plant formation, but I was always focused on the solar system. And I will not actually talk about the solar system uh, in this talk, but there's a bit of, about it in the chapter. But there are other archetype systems now, and one that's extremely interesting to me is TRAPPIST-1. Uh, and I will try to explain a little bit about our current views about how to recreate really uh, uh, such, a, such an important system. So an, an, an idea is to start out around the snow line with a population of plant decimals that form out uh, at this specific location. Many of these plant decimals kind of get scattered out and some of them make it a little bit further outwards and then they grow large enough to start efficiently accreting pebbles, migrate inwards, and then they all pile up close to the inner edge of the system. Then we have very good, I would say, dynamical idea how the, basically the, uh, the expansion of this inner disk edge drives some of these plants to fall inwards of the inner edge and have another sort of uh, part of the system that remains outside and undergoes tidal expansion. And then you can create, recreate basically the eccentric, currently ec observed eccentricities of the trappist plants and also the observed tree body resonances. Now, and it, that's sort of about the dynamical uh, aspect of this system, but we can also do quite well with reproducing the remarkable uniform composition of all these planets. So this is a mass radius relationship. So here's mass in Earth masses, planets in radii. See that they all basically are Earth-like uh, planets with a bit of a spread, but very tight on the mass radius relationship. And this sort of uniform composition is quite well explained by, first of all, an idea that they all form at this uh, uh, ice line location. That means they all undergo basically very comparable uh, growth uh, evolutions. They end up with this kind of characteristic one Earth mass, uh, final masses, because the pebble isolation mass around low mass stars is around one Earth mass. And then if you want to deplete them in volatiles, so I think a very plausible path is that it just happens during the accretion of these pebbles, they get and, and they are, the volatiles are basically ablated in the upper parts of the envelope that then also lose vapor through advection. All right, so I think, so taken together, I think we can uh, make models that really fit with a really a large number of very important and well-measured constraints. Okay, so now we're getting to the conclusions. So right now, plant formation 
uh, operates between uh, important observational constraints that come from two directions. One is from uh, class, uh, the, the, obser the observed protoplanetary disks, and the other parts come from the observed exoplanet populations. Some things that we learned during this talk is that I think plants form early and pebbles are abundantly present so already in the class one phase uh, of disk evolution. The pebble blocks, uh, pebbles are likely the building blocks for plant decimals, but where and when they are formed is not yet well understood. Uh, will be an active area of research. Uh, pebble accretion is a promising path to wide orbit plant formation, uh, but as we have seen now also for this rapid system, it can also work in very different types of settings. But it, but it does really critically require on the emergence of large plant decimal seeds and that possibly helped by a phase of actually plant decimal, plant decimal uh, interaction and collisions. Then we talked also about, I didn't add a point in, but we also talked about gas accretion and many important areas uh, of evolution there as well. Now, I think our consensus view is that uh, the major sort of outlines of plant formation, all the different processes uh, are kind of present and that most of the actually progress in the, in the coming years will come from sort of addressing larger and larger sections of the complete uh, plant small formation uh, process. Or just by you know, staring very long at this figure, being confused, looking at all the arrows, or maybe, wait a second, I think I see something. Could it be? It's the answer. It's pebbles. <laughs> oh my god. All right, no, more seriously, uh, if you want to learn more about this last point, there's really uh, excellent, excellent posters uh, and the plant formation part. So please do have a look at them all. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. <coughs> Excuse me. So that was a fantastic talk and also 30 minutes. So that's really good. That means 20 minutes of questions. So <laughs> if you want to carry on for another five, feel free. I mean, maybe have some more jokes to tell us or some interesting cartoons. So I, I'll, I'll do the answers. Okay, yeah. you go with the answers. Great stuff. Okay. Um, well, obviously a lot of questions to ask. So let me remind you all, please uh, give your name, your affiliation. Try to keep your questions short. Try to keep your answers short, and then we'll get as many questions as possible. We'll start over here, I think. Yep. Hi, Hi Ilsa Cleves, University Hi. of Virginia. Uh, the fact that planets are forming so early, is there an interesting constraint in the fact that the pebble disk stays thin? Do you expect it to get dynamically stirred up? Can that tell us something about the mass of, of the early planetesimals? Uh, yeah, so I think I, we have to be a bit careful. I think, I mean, there is a phase in, in uh, when we say early, it's a bit vague word. So, I mean, there is a phase <laughs> when protoplanetary disks are extremely violent uh, environments during their formation, where probably uh, likely also undergo gravitational instabilities are very turbulent. And that phase, I think, uh, is not so nice for, 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 uh, for any form of plant formation, really. But if you go a little bit later, it does. And then, for the pebble distribution, I mean, they're very coupled to the gas disk, and if we look at these outer parts, at least of protoplanetary disks, there seems to be very little turbulence. So the fact that there's little turbulence and that these pebbles feel gas drag means that they really very easily settle and are not so easily perturbed by other processes. So I don't think you see something immediately in the, uh, yeah, in the stirring of a, of a population, because like, gas drag is, an, is still a very important factor there. Yeah. All right, thank you. Over here, yes. Hidekas Tanaka, okay. Tohoku yeah. University. Thank you for nice talk, Michelle. Yeah. Uh, I have a comment on the growth track. Yes. And uh, type two migration. Yes. And uh, th there are two slowing down mechanisms for the type two migration. Yes. One is the uh, surface density reduction due to the gap formation. Right. And the uh, second is uh, surface density deduction due to the rapid gas accretion. Yes. In the most uh, population synthesis uh, calculation, the second slowing down is not uh, included. So I recommend uh, uh, most uh, uh, population synthesis uh, calculation includes the, the second slowing down effect. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And then I think also we've seen in the previous talk that if we go into low viscosity environments, uh, plant migration becomes considerably more complex. And uh, 
yeah, absolutely, it needs to be addressed. Yeah, I agree. Over here. Uh, Mara Brindikji, I'm a graduate student at uh, Arizona State University. Thanks for the great talk. Um, my question is more about disks around the lowest mass objects, specifically right. brown dwarfs. I know you talked a little about Trappist at the end, but how yeah. do we expect these planet formation theories to hold up or evolve around these disks yeah. around the lowest mass, ob uh, mass objects? Yeah. yeah, very interesting question. I think uh, what I sort of wanted to hint at uh, with this uh, Trappist system that is around the very low mass star, 0 0.1 solar mass or so, uh, is that, for example, when we look at Earth-like planets there, they are effectively formed in a similar way as the super-Earths around solar-like stars. So even though we call them Earth-like Earth -like planets around Trappist, they are basically, in some form, they're, they're more comparable from a formation viewpoint to super-Earths. So, so the, this dominant population of Earth-like planets around M dwarfs is sort of the, the mirror effect of, of what we have around sun-like uh, sun -like stars. So I think there are clear parallels to be drawn. And going to even lower mass stars, I know there's a, uh, a paper by Bebe Liu that looked in detail into the conditions for plant formation around such stars, uh, such low mass stars. And the, my, my general takeaway from this is that the nothing seems to be really inhibited. Everything just shrinks, uh, as we sort of see in, in, a, in a Trappist system. Thank you so much. Yeah. Giovanni? Yeah, Giovanni Rosotti from the University yeah. of Milan. Thank you, Michiel, for the really, really nice talk. So I was wondering about if you can comment about the, the role of substructures that, of course, now we know it's ubiquitous in disks. Yeah. Does it mean that by slowing down drift, planet formation is, is actually slower than it would be predicted by, by pebble accretion? And so we, we have a problem in explaining early planet formation. Uh, I, um, I think, uh, yeah, so we, we didn't talk so much about substructures um, and um, it, it is a very good point. I mean, in a way, you have a mass budget, and if you hold down the, I mean, it, the, the main effect is the cumulative effect of m moving pebbles into interior orbits, and so uh, that is effectively what drives, uh, what drives the growth of planets, and if you do it a little bit slower or a little bit faster, it just sets the time scale of planet formation. Uh, and I agree in your, in your way, if, if you would hold everything in, in pressure bumps at the outer disk, you would, will starve or it would take too long for the inner plants to form. But I'm not certain that this is uh, what we see in these pressure bumps uh, or these big rings that might really be an effect of the largest uh, disks that also form planets at very wide orbits. It's something also that we explored in the paper with Johan Appelgren. It seems to be about 5% of all disks seem to have a strong reduction in the pebble flux. All the other ones seem to just make basically compact disks that are concentrated in, in pebbles. This would be my take. This is a bit of a personal answer. But I do agree that this is a, a general point that needs to be, be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Uh, Masahiro Ogihara from hey. TDLI. So yeah, uh, it seems uh, pebble accretion will be uh, useful uh, for forming, forming planets, especially mm -hmm. for you know, giant planets in wider <laughs> orbit. But at the same time, there are several cases where planetesimal is also a planetesimal equation is uh, also good to form planets. So I was wondering if there are uh, any ways to tell whether you know uh, planets uh, formed by pebble equation or planetesimal equation. Well, I know it, this is a difficult question, but do you have no. any insights on that? I don't have a very good idea about this. I think. Uh um, it is absolutely true that if you go in short orbits, let's say around, uh, around, uh, around an AU, you can do, for example, terrestrial plant formation or even trappist-like systems purely by a plant small formation. It does require critically very efficient uh, conversion of pebbles to plant small. So I hope the, the, our understanding will come actually through a better understanding of the plant small formation process and maybe I, I think it's less likely that we will get it from some form of an observational constraints or something along those lines. But yeah, I don't know if any of my co-authors wants to, to comment on that. Uh, but, yeah. Any co-authors want to comment on that? That's a no. <laughs> yeah, Mario? That's a very, it's a, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a critical question. It's, yeah. a very, uh, it's very important. Yeah. yeah, very good question. Yeah. Mario. Uh, Konstantin Gavik, uh, Yale University. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, streaming instability as sort of the only catalyst for planetesimal formation, but I'm not so convinced that it's the only uh, theoretical pathway that would work. Uh, specifically, I'd like you to I'd invite you to comment on secular gravitational instability and whether or not there are ways to disentangle 
uh, streaming instability, planetesimal formation versus uh, secular gravitational instability or other ones? Yeah, no, very good question. I think I want to say that I think there is very good constraints from the cold cap belt uh, population that uh, planetesimals formed by the collapse of these dense pebble swarms. Uh, but of course, the way they are triggered, that is, a, that is very much a different question. Um, so that does not, I mean, for my, my that's again a, maybe a bit more personal view, but it not, does not need to be the stream instability. It could be any other form that basically concentrates material to Roche density like densities. So, um, yeah, so the constraints really comes from having dense mid layer layers and and uh, basically a non-linear state where you can drive these gravitational collapsing swarms. How we reach there is m much more of an open discussion and we, we definitely need to keep, uh, as a community, our eyes open to alternatives to the streaming stability, which is true, are very harsh conditions to reach. It's not obvious, I agree. Thank you. Yes. Michelle Bannister, University Hi. of Canterbury. Um, I get to actually cut, uh, comment slightly to that point. So thank you for highlighting our work with the Outer Solar System mm. Origin Survey for the cold classical yeah. size distribution. We have a recent finding that the hot classical size distribution for sizes under uh, about 400 kilometers is consistent with that size distribution. So in the context of the streaming instability, um, what would be your thoughts for that, given hot classicals uh, implied to have formed in a very different part of the disk? Yeah, that is a, that is a surprising finding uh, because I think if uh, the cold classicals are, are, are sort of the magical region because we don't believe that they had any collisional interactions because they're all in, in basically in, in wide binaries, uh, while the, the other population probably comes from a much denser inner part of the solar system where collisions probably would have been important. Uh, so it maybe hints at a sort of a lower density formation side of these uh, uh, also, inner inner density planetesimals. Yeah, I, I don't on the spot cannot come up with something uh, yeah more profound to say. I think yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Doug Johnstone, National yeah. Research Council of Canada. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. I'm getting a little bit lost in some of this. But uh, the yeah. planetesimal seeds that you started with, and then when you did your synthesis, you mm. ended up leaving a lot of small stuff at large radii. And I'm wondering, do you think that stuff is still there, but we're not seeing it yet? Or do you think it gets dynamically removed? Or what do I do with that zone? It's yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a, a real prediction of basically any planet formation model at this point in time, that there must be a population uh, of small planets at wide orbits that are sort of the leftovers that did not make it to become wide orbit giant planets. So this, this whole population over here here and here, I think it's real, and hopefully, maybe with gravitational, uh, maybe with Gaia, or maybe with gravitational lensing, we can start 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 probing uh, deeper and deeper in this region. I think we'll find many many plants. There. But is that like uh, another? Is that about the same order as the planets that there are in the other bits? Like I'm trying to, is this actually an important bit, and do you need to worry about being able to dynamically remove them? Ah. Um, uh, I think, um, I think no, because I think we're really talking about systems. In some systems, all plants make it to w giant plants, solar system-like, and some system they sort of all before fall below the sort of kind of ice giant limits. And the idea that I don't, the, the reason I don't think that it becomes a sort of a mixed population has to do with that basically it's set by the by the basic mass budget in protoplanet disk either. Either you drive them all up, or you sort of uh, uh, just don't reach this kind of critical core mass in the core accretion scenario to make them to gas shine. So you, you, you sort of fall into one or the two bins uh, of systems. Yeah, that's not so clear in a, in a plot where you mix everything. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Over here. Yep. Hi. Um, Akimasa Kataoka from National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. Yes. So I have a question and slash comment on mm. the, the initial size of pebbles. Mm. So I think that this community used the pebble size of millimeter size because of the uh, previous observational constraints, which mm. suggest millimeter size particles mm. in protoplanetary disks. Mm. But uh, as Ilse presented yesterday, mm. um, there have been significant updates on the observational constraints on the dust size, mm. which 
suggests maybe there are full of 100 microsized grains in protoplanetary disks. Uh, what if the particles in disks are full of 100 microsized grains so that the Stokes number is much lower than expected? Mm -hmm. What if, what, yeah. if it is the case, then how does this change the situation? Yeah, so I think uh, in, yeah, so if we, yeah, so I think, uh, for example, in this work with, uh, with Yuan Applegrain, we used the fragmentation velocity of one meter a second also because it shows that one needs to retain a large part of the pebble population in the outer part for some time before sort of letting it uh, uh, drift inward. So I think all, also from that perspective, it's clear that pebbles, at least in the outer disk, where basically most of the pebbles are and are sort of sent inwards, have to be small. So I think we, we're starting to include that in the models, either the, through lowering the fragmentation velocity or, or slowly starting to consider lower, uh, effectively means of having lower stocks numbers. So yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think it's real and important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Four minutes left for questions, so let's uh, try to keep the questions short. Okay, uh, no one over here. Yeah, go ahead, Jehan. Jehan Bay, University of Florida. Um, so I want to ask about cold giants and pebble accretion. Mm -hmm. So we have PDS-70, fused mm -hmm. pure masses at 20 AU, 35 AU, HR 8799, multiple gas giants at tens of AUs, and of course substructures. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that they are all formed by planets, but yeah. at least some of them. Yeah. So if I wanted to form a Jupiter mass planet, for example, at 100 AU, yeah. would you say that pebble accretion can do that, or at this point do we need gravitational instability? Um, I think uh, uh, for systems like HI 8799, which are extreme, but still fall within the sort of 60 AU limit, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this I think is possible with pebble accretion, provided that it's a high metallicity disk. So it does have to be one that is an outlier. Now HI 8799 is also maybe a rare type of disk around a, a higher mass star. So I think uh, this, is, this is plausible. F but sort of the generic 100 AU, planet is, a, is, is difficult to imagine with pebble accretion. It, there does come a limit at which point things become very slow and maybe gravitational instabilities are, are, are an option, although this is also not so easy as we've seen. Migration rates are very, very fast. So even if you form, you have to form these plants, you typically form these plants very early in the evolution and then they start drifting, migrating inwards. So you cannot easily keep them at 100 AU either. So I think these are still, yeah. Yeah, hard to understand at this yeah. point. Thank you. Something for protostars and planets eight, I think. Yes, over here. Yeah. Hi, Wei Zhu from Tsinghua University in Beijing. So I saw you list uh, this uh, correlation between inner supers and mm. outer cold giants as yeah. uh, outstanding challenges. Yeah. So I want to, maybe you can comment a little bit more on this, like uh, whether there's any uh, uh, missing, more missing uh, physical processes that uh, should be included to reproduce this or some minor changes to the model. Yeah. I, think it's a, I think it's a huge opportunity. Uh, I think the observational evidence for any form of correlation is still difficult. It might also seem that it at least doesn't seem to be a very clear correlation in either way that uh, either the, the uh, cold giants always have super Earths or cold giants never have super Earths. None of this seems to be very clear, so it seems to be just a bit of a mixed bag. So in a way, maybe maybe the cold giant does not play so much of a role. And then we have to understand why it does not play big, big of a role. Uh, it might be that, uh, for example, these uh, cold giants are not efficient in halting the pebble flux. Like say, if the, the pebbles are efficiently fragmented, they could just sort of transit the gap and show up on the other side. It might be also simply that giant plants typically emerge relatively late in the evolution of protoplanetary disks, as we've seen before, that could explain their final masses. In which case, well, most pebbles already made it to the inner disk. Even ignoring all of that, forming a 10 Earth mass core means that effectively you send 90 Earth masses past your core to the inner disk. So from that basic perspective, there's always mass available to form, I would say, a, a multiple of, of planets interior to, to Jupiter-like planets. It's about really carefully going through this problem, I think. Right. Two minutes left, so three questions. We're going to start over here, here, and Thomas, final question. Sorry, everybody else. We're just running out of time, as usual. Sorry. Okay, Hiroshi Kobayashi from Nagoya University. So I, I'd like to discuss the uh, uh, pebble acquisition efficiency. As you showed, uh, the efficiency is very low. And uh, if we consider the uh, gas flow part of the, by the plot planet, 
it reduces the significantly. So um, take into account uh, this effect, then uh, even if we can prepare the several hundred Earth mass pebble, uh, we couldn't produce a Jupiter-like gas planet. Do you want to comment it? Uh, no, I think, I think that's, uh, that is important to determine these efficiencies as good as we can. That's also why I listed it as one of the, uh, one of the outstanding uh, challenges, especially, I think, uh, this effect which you described, but even maybe more so basically the stirring of the, of the pebble layer in the mid plane. So there, there are many ways in which pebble accretion uh, cannot work. And that if we, for example, find that, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, pebbles are typically very well stirred in observed protoplanetary disk. We can just rule out pebble accretion. We can just rule it out. So I think anything in this direction is very important. And uh, as a final comment on the efficiency question, I do think it's very important that we keep in mind that we also don't know what is the efficiency of forming plant smalls, right? So mm. that is, uh, of course, also an issue. All right, thank you. Two very short questions, please, over here, and then Thomas finally. Okay, Ta um, Takeru Suzuki from the University okay. of Tokyo. My question is regarding the metallicity dependence. Mm -hmm. uh, your uh, pebble acquisition synthesis model shows a uh, very sensitive or rapid dependence of mm -hmm. finer masses of yeah. met on metallicity. Yeah. Uh, my question is a quantitative one. If you play the same game for planetesima scenario, do you mm -hmm. expect the same or different uh, quantitative dependence on metallicity? Um, I think it turns out that um, um, I think um, I would say from a population synthesis view, my understanding is that with both pebble accretion and plantismal accretion scenarios, we can reproduce, for example, the metallicity dependence on the occurrence of whole giant uh, planets and the sort of softer or very weak metallicity dependency uh, for super Earths. Although, I would say pebble accretion does a little bit better in the sense that it's very sensitive uh, in, in, uh, in the formation of gas giant plants because it brings either plants up to the pebble isolation mass or not. And when you reach pebble isolation mass, you trigger gas giant formation. And it is uh, somewhat weaker when considering the formation of the birds. It's a bit complicated, but uh, I think it goes in the right way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Final question, Thomas, yes. Uh, Thomas Henning, Max Planck Institute yeah. for Astronomy in Heidelberg. Uh, great talk, me. Thanks. Uh, at the end of the talk, you discussed the TOPIST-1 system, uh, yeah. but recent surveys actually show that these systems are extremely rare. Yeah. Uh, so what is a switch uh, in your models uh, to produce TOPIST-1 systems or the usual systems? Uh, is this just a pebble uh, efficiency, accretion efficiency? And if it is an efficiency, uh, what is actually determining uh, this quantity then? Very good question. I, I don't, I mean, my intuition would actually be because uh, this uh, Trappist scenario that we showed here is very generic, does not, lead, need, does, need, does not need a large mass budget of pebbles, given what we think we know about the mass budget uh, and the scaling of uh, disk mass with stellar mass. Um, so it is somewhat surprising from a plant formation viewpoint that the Trappist systems are not abundantly generated all the time, because it is almost, I would say, the easiest type of system we can form. So there is certainly something to, to worry about there. So there's a tension. <laughs> there is a tension. Okay, well, that's a very interesting set of questions and answers. Let's thank Mikhail again for a very interesting talk.